six of us had put 44 tonne on in less than six hours. So it was all work, 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 full on. Put the ropes onto the wharf to hold the boat up, otherwise we'll go under, we'll sink. That's how much fish we had on it. I've seen photos of the Hermes. The only part of her out of the water was, was the wheelhouse. It's no wonder that we lost boats. Uh, it was a tough life. Yeah, the palming days were the good days. It was, there was nothing better than catching bluefin. <laughs> These were the days, my friend. We thought they'd never end. <laughs> it was great. Those were the days, my friend. We thought they'd never end. We'd sing and dance forever and a day. Once a fish considered only fit for canning, tuna has rocketed to the status of a gourmet food. Riding along on this wave of popularity have been the fortunes of those who catch it. From humble beginnings grew a multi-million dollar industry, only to crash when stocks were depleted. Then came another bonanza, when like a phoenix rising from the ashes, tuna ranching revitalized the industry. Southern bluefin tuna spawn south of Indonesia, but they range right across the southern oceans from Africa to South America. Bases for the commercial fishery in Australia have included southern New South Wales ports from Eden to Ulladulla in the east, Albany and Esperance in the southwest. But the major area of activity has always been Port Lincoln in South Australia. Tuna Town. Our story begins long ago. Just as gold rushes create booms, followed by a bust, with ghost towns often being the only reminder of past glories, so it was with the tuna industry. From the 1920s onward, within sight of the Californian gold fields, developed one of the most powerful fishing fleets the world had ever seen. The white timbered hulls of the stylish American tuna clippers were dominating the Western Americas and deep into the Pacific. Thousands of tons of tuna were landed and canned in the tuna capital of the world, San Diego. Come with us to San Diego. There, the California Packing Corporation has its modern tuna canning establishment. And from there, we invite you to journey with us on the good ship navigator into the South Pacific realm of the fighting tuna. Thousands of people were employed in the fishing industry along the Californian coast. A society immortalized in John Steinbeck's bestseller, Cannery Row. Australians learned of this dynamic industry through magazines and movies, as well as the books of the famous big game fisherman and author Zane Grey. Through the 1930s, the Australian government, industrialists and fishermen, envious of the American scenario, were spurred on to think big. If Australia had tuna, why couldn't we have canning and boat building businesses like California? The prize was tempting. But, as with all gold rushes, it was not that simple. Attempts were made. As early as 1939, two large former Tasmanian trading catches, the Terralina and the Kaura, along with CSIRO's research vessel Warreen, were all at Port Lincoln, set up for polling tuna for the newly opened cannery. However, success eluded them all. World War II intervened, and it would be another 16 years before commercial quantities of tuna were landed in Lincoln. When the Australian fishery began in 1949, we were over 30 years behind California, but we would catch up with the help 
of the Americans. The first truly commercial catches of bluefin tuna were made on the southern New South Wales coast in the late 1940s. This was due to a downturn in traditional catches of salmon and barracuda. The Eden and Naruma canneries turned their attention to tuna, paying fishermen six pence a pound, or about ten cents a kilo. And then the, you had the small boats, those little 30-footers, fishing out of Bermagui. <clears throat> they were all, it was all troll line fishing, even the Eden boats were troll, it was all troll line fishing. Uh, not out, not out to the shelf either, probably out to 80 fathoms, thereabouts. Even we had a go of it, went up the bush, cut some saplings, made some outriggers, and we had three jigs on either side and two on the stern. And you could catch a tonne, two tonne, three tonne a day like that. Every headland, North Head, South Head, Haycock Point, Green Cape, every big headland would have a big, a big tightly packed school laying off it for weeks and weeks. Yeah, and little little schools had come in the bay and they were here till March. Canary had just started to buy them. There was a lot of boats trolling and a 10 ton day by all the boats was considered a big day's fishing. And In the spring and summer of 1949-50, a hundred boats based in southern New South Wales ports landed a thousand tonne of tuna using troll lines. The extent of the tuna resource was being recognised. In an effort to boost production, the management of the Naruma cannery sponsored an American tuna fisherman from Hawaii to come out and show the locals the skills of the live bait and pole method. His name was David Correa. But he was a stripy, stripy fisherman, not a, not a, wasn't into the big, the bigger fish at all. And he was the first one to come out and show us the, the bait and pole method. The vessel chosen was an old 45-foot seine trawler, the Canberra, owned by Les and Frank Greer. One steel bait tank on a deck and a pump driven by a petrol engine, it sat on the deck. <laughs> and away the Hawaiian Jap and the crew went, trying to catch stripies. At about the same time, the modern 75-foot tuna clipper, Sanaboa, owned by Don Hayward and operating in Fijian waters, arrived in Australia on an exploratory pole live bait fishing expedition. She arrived in Sydney in September 1950, and on her first trip, landed 12 tonnes of southern bluefin tuna east of Jervis Bay. Working their way down to Eden, more significant catches were made. With the Sunnibo's success, the Australian pole fishery was born. It really, in a nutshell, established that there's a, there's a possible future in, in uh, tuna fishing. Among the first Australian boats to fit out for poling tuna, Apart from the Greer brothers, who had already set up the Canberra, were Kevin Warren in the Silver Cloud and Pat and Barry Warren in the Little Kaya. We were the first three to put bait tanks on small boats here in Eden. Kevin had his boat fitted out before we did, yeah. One of the fishermen on the Sanibua, when undertaking the Australian survey, was Johnny Hill, who returned the following year and skippered the fair venture for businessman Fred Fair. Built in Melbourne in 1951, Fair Venture was Eden's first purpose-built tuna polar. It was only a little thing, it was only 40 foot, I think it was. And he then got into it and um, he was showing the ropes to, to, to everyone working out of Eden uh, how, how to do it and he was quite successful. As a result of this success, the Eden polling feat increased in numbers. Meanwhile, in Port Lincoln, the Haldane brothers in the American design Tacoma were endeavouring to net tuna by purse seining. They had uh, uh, all the uh, American gear. Um, unfortunately, uh, cotton net, fish diving, um, and the gear just couldn't be handled in our conditions. 
Well, for starters, the net we were using was way far too heavy, very heavy to handle, and it all had to be put on board, not by a periodic block, but by winch lift up, drop down, and it was a, a hell of a job. And I certainly didn't have a net to suit the conditions and the gear we had. In 1953, the Tacoma succeeded in netting eight tons of tuna in Boston Bay. But this was in ideal calm conditions, quite different to the open ocean where most fishing was carried out. Uh, we didn't have the Californian uh, calm weather and uh, again that met with failure. Following four years of trial and error and surviving on salmon and shark fishing, the Haldanes were successful in lobbying the South Australian government to bring out two experienced pole and live bait fishermen from America to show them how to achieve good results. The Jangard brothers arrived in January 1956. The first task was to catch live bait for chumming up the tuna in order to create a feeding frenzy. Fifteen vain attempts Netting day and night for a week were made before success was achieved, using a light at night and a modified Lampara net. The first successful fishing day resulted in 700 tuna being pulled at Rocky Island. I fished alongside one of the Jengards, one of the brothers, and uh, helped them wreck. He says, what's what I'm doing? And you do the same. And I learned from him a good teacher and I finished up being a, a pretty good poleman all these years. Portland fisherman Bert Wilson was also at Port Lincoln trying to catch tuna in a former tug which Fred Fair had converted to tuna fishing and renamed Fair Tuna. Bert was also looking for direction from the Americans. Sperry Jan Gard came with me for the last month of his stay over here which was total three months. And <clears throat> so Haldane's had two months start on me on pole fishing tuna. Sperry and I got stuck into the tuna and uh, I learnt it pretty well. Uh, old fair tuna was uh, very low wooded, although she made a steel, but that's the way you'd class her. She was very low. And uh, although she had beautiful refrigeration. Bert came up here, a very switched on chappy and uh, he had an old Navy converted tug called the Fair Tuna and she, uh, she was a submarine. She should have been called the submarine but hell we put some fish on board that boat. Uh, yeah, uh, that was the starting of the real Fair Dinkum polling in the fleet when uh, six of us had put 44 tonne on in Less than six hours polling. Uh, it's a lot of fish. Meanwhile, in Eden, the tuna fleet had been steadily expanding, mainly by converting seine trawlers to tuna polling for the four-month season by fitting live bait tanks into the rope wells. One of the first and most successful to do this was the 50-foot Mamina, owned by Cliff Gibson, on which this old footage was shot. With the fishery fast developing, there was a rush for suitable vessels. Initially, most boats were converted from other fisheries. The first vessel that Eden fishing entrepreneur Owen Allen converted to tuna was the 60-foot cray shark boat Loch Lomond, skippered by Frank Broder. With her success, Owen Allen followed up by converting the much larger former ferry Estelle Star. Ken Tidswell oversaw the conversion and went in her as skipper, soon making a reputation for himself and the vessel. I have to say that Ken Tidswell would have been the smartest switched on tuna fisherman on the East Coast. Owen Allen followed up the Estelle Star with an even larger conversion, the DG. The fleet was developing into a motley collection of vessels. We had boats from like the DG, which was a, a little cargo ship from the South Pacific, um, and then to yachts, the Bintang, T-Rang, she was a, 
a teak two-masted yacht, <laughs> double ender, um, and then there was everything else in between. Old the old Kate Byron, a, a tender from the Sydney Harbour. She was an old, originally a steam boat, I think. Um, there was a couple of work boats, 40-foot work boats, which were common in the fisheries around Australia. Um, the Challenge, she was a later Yatala Reef, a um, boat built for the Army or Navy, an um, 80 foot sort of work boat type thing. So we did have a variety of boats. Um, and then the ultimate, I suppose, that, it, that polled in Australia was the, the favourite, an American boat, which was probably purpose built for polling tuna, which and that sort of uh, that was the the ultimate big boat, you know, 105 feet, and powerful, big, plenty of freeboard. Didn't worry about too much about the weather. You could handle anything that was coming and and carry the necessary, uh, you know, fish and and bait and fuel and everything else. But most a lot of fisheries in Australia were started off with boats that weren't suitable at all for the job and. Um, they always struggled, you know, they were always, it was always hard on these boats. One of the early boats into the fishery was the Mary Ann Sims, converted from hand lining and netting in Spencer Gulf. It was, uh, as, as the boat was built in the first place, a schooner rigged and, uh, and I, I would still say that I'd be the only one that's ever pulled tuna over the stern of the boat under sail no engine, like no engine going and it was good because it, uh, the tuna came up closer because there was no, no noise. Uh, but then uh, I was two years like that with the boat uh, under sail. It was generally thought that wooden boats had an advantage over steel boats. The wood seemed to fish better, the wooden boats seemed to fish better than uh, the new steel boats that were coming into the picture. Uh, they could hold a school of fish for longer and and get more out of it. We noticed that the bigger boats had to have more skills for the day than what a little boat would have to have to get the same amount of tonnage. By the late 1950s, a distinct fishing pattern was developing, beginning with Port Lincoln boats sailing to Eden for their season from October to December, and the Eden boats going to Lincoln for their season, December till May. The voyage could take six days, or a lot longer, depending on the weather. Often families followed the fishermen overland on this annual migration. The whole um, tuna fishing people, the whole lot went. The trucks, the pilots, the fishermen, we all went to Port Lincoln. It was like a caravan going across there. We had an old Ford station wagon, and in those days you didn't have to have seat belts, so we had a big mattress in the back, and the kids slept all the way. As soon as we hit the road, our kids went to sleep. Two days, I think it took, and when you get to South Australia, the roads are straight. Oh, I used to see things that weren't there. I was that tired. <laughs> and more and more tuna fishermen's families went as well. Not all families came overland. Bill Gordon brought his wife and children on board the DG. In 1961, I was five years old. I remember coming to Port Lincoln and we put the ute on the top deck and all our furniture in the hull. Yeah. And that's when we arrived and we first stayed at the pier <laughs> hotel and I thought it was magnificent. <laughs> While some people lived in caravans, others rented trust homes. In 1960, the Puglisi brothers moved to Port Lincoln with their boat St Michael and their families. And when my wife arrived with the four kids, and when I took her up to Bunta Crescent to show her where we were going to live, they just installed the sewerage. The drive was all dug up, the backyard was a mess. There wasn't a bit of green to be seen anywhere and my wife just burst into tears. <laughs> she said, we're going to live here. I said, yeah, well, this, this is where we're going to live. That was my first impression of Port Lincoln, desert. 
So, um, yeah, it wasn't a very nice place. There were a lot of fishermen living in the trust homes at the time, and that's where we all got our start. And, and at that time, we didn't even own a motor car. We, we had bought a little, a little Austin car that we shared between my brother and myself. Either, he would either have it of a Saturday, and we would have it of a Sunday. But each year we went there, it got better and we were more organised and more and more tuna fishermen's families went as well. So we all sort of, um, we had barbecues together, picnics, went to the pub. A lot of crew from Newcastle were coming over, a lot of crew from Sydney come over, a lot of, of course, the Ulla Dulla and the Eden boys come over. There were some Tasmanian fellas that came over. The boost of the young male population was not wasted on the Port Lincoln girls. I think it had a good big impact on the, the female side, the female pe girls that were around, because they were they were they were different. They they were interesting. They had plenty of money to spend, and we partied, and we had a ball. The girls seemed to show up, and we found girls, and they found us, and you know you'd you'd get to know them, and the They'd be part of your activities, you know, you, you have a few beers and there'd be a few, few of them that meet you on the wharves that when you, they'd be saying goodbye to you and they'd meet you on the wharves when you come back again. Um, walk down the jetty, uh, a group of us quite often and we'd go on the boats and just spend a pleasant afternoon. Oh, they, they, they just enjoyed life, you know, I mean, they were out fishing and, and doing a, a, it's a bloody, it was a bloody hard job polling fish in those days, so all they wanted to do when they came back into shore was to party and enjoy life. There wasn't a lot of hanky-panky going on. You know, this was a small town. But there was nothing sexual about the whole thing because I was too afraid to because of <laughs> my father. It was a standing joke amongst the girls, you know, who used to go and visit the boats and so on, that um, uh, a guy would ask you, oh, and in fact, I remember when it happened to me, um, one of the guys said, oh, would you like to uh, come and look at the Golden Rivet? And I said, mm, what do you mean? And so he said, well, you know, it's the Golden Rivet. We've got it on board the boat. We just have to go down below sort of thing. And I, I thought, ah, this is bullshit. <laughs> something going on here so of course I declined but then that became the standard sort of joke you know if a guy wanted to get you down below he'd say come and look at the golden river <laughs> girls are always part of it it's human human nature still still same thing happens today it was a good time in my life I enjoyed their company I wish I was a fisherman Yeah, fishing at, uh, on the east coast was much different to Lincoln. Um, here we looked all the time for ripplers and uh, jump, all the birds working. At that time of the year we used to see, have the mutton birds coming down the coast. There were times when looking out through the headland here all you could see was black. You don't see them anymore. And these mutton birds were here when the tuna were here and you'd see and we'd use the mutton birds as, as guides as bird patches and so on and so forth. The Eden guys would come to Lincoln and and then vice versa the, the port, some of the Port Lincoln guys would go back to Eden and a, a lot of the, the boats were out of the small harbours there that were coming out of Kiama and Naruma and Bermagui and and Eden um, and they were only between 40 and, and 50 feet and some of them even had 44 drums on the deck for their bait tank that was the bait tank um, but they were good at catching the fish because they could turn they a lot of the fish were, were caught on with the troll line um, system with finding them with the troll line then you'd 
chum up and back onto them again. And with the bigger boat, we had trouble. We, we had difficulty getting onto them with the troll line, whereas these little boats would, they couldn't catch much when they could only put five, 10 tonne on them, but they, they would get it regularly. So a lot of the little boats did quite well. By the early 1960s, purpose-built tuna boats were being designed. The first of these was the 60-foot Herme, built by porters in Adelaide for Bert Wilson. Then followed such vessels as Cape Barron for Mike Berberus, Southern Bluefin for Bob Chapman, and Lativa for Barry Sims. In the mid-60s, there were two boats built which were larger than the fleet average. One was the Serenia Pearl, built by Porter's Boatyard in Adelaide for Bert Wilson. At 86 feet, the largest Australian-built timber tuna vessel to that time, purposely eclipsing the Tacoma by one foot. The other was the 92-foot Carina G, built by Adelaide Ship Construction for the Gibson family, first of the large purpose-built steel boats. In 1963, there were 20 boats in the Port Lincoln tuna fleet. By 1968, there were 40. Competition was increasing. 1967-68 saw a downturn in the tuna fishery. Catches per vessel were down by well over half on the long-term averages, causing a major shake-up in the fishery. Ken Tidswell, who in 1962 had landed over 500 tonne, managed to bring home a catch of just 150 tonne in 1966. Some of the pioneers, including Haldane Brothers, Bert Wilson, Ken Tidswell and Bill Gordon, could see no future in tuna and sailed off to join the new Gulf of Carpentaria prawn fishery. Others went into the new Spencer Gulf prawn fishery, which had recently been pioneered by Roger Howlett. That those two industries had a uh, de facto relationship for the next uh, uh, 40 years, which, which uh, was, it's quite fascinating in, in fisheries management terms. By 1968, half the tuna fishermen were from the small island port of Kali on the Adriatic coast of what is now Croatia. These young men migrated to seek a more prosperous future than that offered under communist rule. The names of those who escaped and made their way to Port Lincoln include Collegia, Gobin, Sarin, Lucan Brothers, Sarunik, Blaznov, Valsik, and Skoljarev, to name a few. These refugees, along with Hagen Steer, Joe Puglisi, and the younger Tony Santik, who has had some success with racehorses, would become the dominant players in the tuna game and become known as the Tuna Barons. Nineteen sixty nine seventy saw an improvement in the tuna fishery. Many boats switched between prawning and tuna fishing seasonally, and technology was improving. Most of the um, innovation was in, not so much on the boats, but it was in the, the, like the spotting and, and that sort of thing. You know, that's, that's what changed the fishing. It was important for your, your tuna spotter, because he was a guy that found your fish. Traditionally, schools of tuna were spotted from the crow's nest, high up the mast, a tedious occupation with limited effectiveness. The first spotter plane was a little single-engined Oster, introduced by the Eden-based Owen Allen Group. The success of aircraft for tuna spotting was obvious, and the fleet of planes steadily grew, as did the competition. You just didn't go out and find your own school of fish. You needed aeroplanes to find the fish for you. They were getting scarcer and scarcer. We got to 12 aircraft circling one patch of fish. That's how bad it got out there. It was ridiculous, but I've seen it. With a, with a 200 foot, 300 foot separation, it was dangerous. More aeroplanes in the sky than the Battle of Britain. Kevin Warren began tuna spotting in 1969, 
a profession with its own set of skills. When we found our first patch of fish for the day, or for any patch afterwards, but typically everyone was on tender hooks waiting for the fish to show. And as soon as we'd caught up, right, we've got a patch here. Um, and we'd, we'd circle it, have a look, just absolutely verify that it was tuna and not stripies or, or something like that. And get a bit of an idea what the tonnage might be in it, size of the fish. Have a look around, see who was the closest boat. After we've been operating for an hour or so in the area, you get have a very good picture in your mind where everybody is. And straight away I'd know that the uh, uh, Maria Luisa was the closest boat or, or somebody else. And obviously there was plenty of times where an opposition boat was, was in front, in which case we would, you'd have that in your mind also. So we didn't dare circle a patch of fish. You'd just fly around and say, well, there's one, but we know that the opposition's closer, so you then just sort of fly past as if you hadn't seen anything, call up the boats and say, you know, start heading in, uh, in such and such a direction. We reckon you've got about 10 miles to run, which is, most of the boats are in the order of 10 knots of steaming time. So you'd, you'd have an hour up your sleeve before they got there. And then we'd go away and, and look for other patches of fish, knowing that that one was there and hoping that the opposition didn't see it. Kiwi White began tuna spotting in 1979. We used to always catch our fish basically south southeast of Sejuna. 132.20 was a hot spot, and previous to that it was 128.40 on the shelf. Uh, we could go out there time and time again. It was just one huge area, and a lot of the fish there didn't ripple. And a lot of I haven't explained that actually yet, but the fish normally on a good summer's day, come up about 11, 12, 1 o'clock, and they come up to the surface, and whether they sunbake like girls on bikinis on the beach, we don't know, but they come up and they ripple, and you pick up the ripple, or there's feeding patches where they're working in bait, or there's flattening patches where they're running down the breeze and leaving a big flattening area behind them, or uh, colour patches, and this 128.40 was a famous spot for colour patches, and the boats couldn't see them, but us in the plains at 1,500 feet or 1,800 feet, because we used to have separation of two or 300 feet, depends on how many planes, we would look down the water. Instead of scanning like this, looking for ripplers and feeding patches and flattening patches, I would look down and I'd spend all my time staring in the water and looking for a dark colour. And then if you circle it and then you see the fish shine and you know it's bluefin, and there was a lot of shenanigans that went on with that too. You know, there was backhanders and people paying money in brown envelopes and brown vapour bags and all sorts of things that, that they got preferential treatment because it was easy for a pilot to, or for a spotter just to not see a patch and tell the other guy that, you know, there's a patch of fish there and you, you missed out, so. Yeah, each company had their own aircraft and, and I think at the time, uh, um, yeah, there was a bit of people with a lot of money, they'd pay the pilots money to, you know, get their boats onto the fish. We, we, we know that was happening. And I hear that um, one person got paid quite a bit of money under the hand, and I'm probably saying the wrong thing, but it's all, I don't care anymore. And somebody was actually given a car by one of the guys uh, to look after him. And I do know a few other stories, but it's probably best I don't say it on, on camera. But uh, there's quite a few things that I could say, but it's better not to. One boat was going back into Bermagui, and the spotter plane was going past, heading down to Marimbula to land. And as he was going over, this particular boat was so angry that he missed out that he was having shots at the, he was having shots at the, the spotter plane. And I'm not going to mention his name. He said, I said, well, any fish around? I was way out of Newt's Reef. And he said, no, there's no, there's just six or eight patches of stripies just a few miles south of you. <clears throat> and I couldn't believe that they were stripies. And he just flew away. And I said to the boys, we're going south and having a look. I went there and we picked up 70 tonne of bluefin. He was saving those fish for another boat. And it was always secret service and codes and everything else which uh, really don't last long.
you can always break them. You, you soon find the, the channels. And But today's radios make it even easier to find uh, anybody. I've never seen so much intrigue and white lies and told so many white lies in my life. <laughs> the sooner you got in the, the rack, the sooner you caught your fish. So it was all work, 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 full on. No arguing, just full on. The polling was the most exciting thing you could ever get. The nearest to it was in the boxing ring. Uh, and you were just going for it. And blood and water and foam and fish whizzing past, being punched either side from the other blokes, fish coming through. And it's all happening so quickly that uh, it's all a blur. It's, a, it's an art to it, polling. And don't believe what the Yugoslavs tell you, they used to pole, single pole, 50 kilo fish. It's all rubbish. If the fish comes up, they always shoot up. If he gets the bait and you get him in the right time, right, he kicks himself out of the water, doesn't he? But if he, if he got the squid or the down a bit and the fish can, comes like that, because he gets the fish and wants to go down again, that's when you, then you start to struggle, you know. If it's a really big fish, a lot of people lost their gear, didn't they, you know. Because if you lost the pole, the fish swam off with the pole and that, the fish would die. You'd lose the school of fish. So that was the golden rule, never let go of your pole. No matter how close you were to going underwater yourself, you know. In South Australia, in the, on the continental shelf in Eden, we used uh, uh, larger, larger squ squids, we called them, actually and uh, they were just just a heavy lead with a barbless hook and uh, the uh, feathers which we and covered with the plastic we'd put a plastic tube over we used to make all those uh, up at night time when we was on watch or when we was traveling we'd make these extras up and then we had a wire leader on on the uh, end of that uh, squid and we'd have them all on the board so you had your different sizes and and as uh, fishermen we always tended to uh, prefer our special size or, or special colour and something that would work for you. And uh, today is no different with all the lures. The lures seem to catch more fishermen than what they do catch fish, but, uh, but we had our preferences. And I used to be a mass man. And I picked up this school of fish in the distance and got up and when we got alongside it the boys were all ready to start fishing and I said watch out they're big fish they're whoppers <laughs> and there were six fellas lined up along the side of the boat double poling the first three fish that struck <laughs> three sets of gear went over the side they couldn't hang on and we finished up triple poling. We had our special poles, nobody was allowed to touch it. We'd make our own poles up and uh, we'd select our, depending on how big a pole you want, they'd be in the thickness in the bottom of the bamboo poles and uh, you'd check them out and you may cut the thicker end off and have it so it could be a bit whippy on the end. And, but we all selected our own poles and uh, you, you, you just seem to get your own preference and, uh, and nobody, nobody would interfere with them. You just kept your own poles and, uh, and we'd have them, in the, uh, have them in a pole rack so that when we'd come across a school of tuna and you'd have to get in the rack, you, we'd make our uh, poling belts out of, a, out of green hide with a army webbing belt around the, to go around our waist and uh, we just made our own and uh, we'd just have everything ready. We'd just have that, that belt wrapped around the, our own poles and uh, so you could, everything was uh, quickly accessible so that uh, because the sooner you got in the, the rack, the sooner you caught your fish. Once the first fish hit the deck, everybody was excited. Just everybody was, the attitude was, let's get them, you know. The actual mad fishing itself, the catching of a fish was mad, mad, mad. It was great, yeah. A lot of guys who were really big and strong, you'd think that they'd be good polers, but they weren't. And uh, a lot of the smaller guys seemed to be able to, to work, uh, pull the fish in. It was very, very exciting. And we felt really proud when we came in with a full load 
and we walked down the jetty after unloading it and you know you're sort of beating your chest that we'd filled up the boat and I don't think there'd be any other game that you work so hard for in such a short time. Well the best day we ever had was 40 tonne in four and a half hours. There's a lot of fish around, we switched the engine off, we were just drifting, piling, the deck was full, rolling over the side, get off, throw a two or three tonne back down in the end of the brine to get back on again, and not the other day finished up. 40 tonne in four and a half hours. I know, double pile fish, they were nice fish. That was the best day we had. Most times we didn't sort of know how long anything took, but one time just off Gabo, we timed one patch and uh, six of us put 28 tonne on in, I think it took three hours, 20 minutes. Uh, single pole fish were about 25 to 30 pounders and double poling was uh, up to about uh, 50 and 60 pounds. Then, of course, you got triple polars, which is up nearly to 200 pounds. We had days in uh, out of Port Lincoln that you'd you'd pull 30, 40 ton of fish, and uh, on a really, really good day. And but you had to have nice, calm w water to uh, find them. And uh, uh, pretty well, all boats would uh, catch fish on those days, but. Uh, uh, some days you'd, you'd pull 30 tonne or 40 tonne at a, at a maximum out of a patch and uh, they were really, really great days and you knew you'd really achieved. You were, you were worn out at the end of the day but uh, you, you really did know that you'd uh, had a good day. It's a never end. <laughs> It'll never end. These are the days, my friend. We thought they'd never end. <laughs> it was great. It used to get very willing at times when the fleet were in close proximity. You'd get um, uh, other boats trying to steal your school. Well, probably the most trouble we had wasn't a great lot, but when the Lincoln boats first started to come, uh, some of those would uh, come fairly close to you and throw bait and things like that. There was a lot of yelling and shouting and holding up rifles and things like that in the in the early days when well, later on he come to about 44 boats in total fleet as we were top boat a lot of boats used to follow me and that was no very good experience because there's like vultures and I remember we biting is tricky by. We catch a bite early, I go sleep, I say, call me when all go out, when no one is left in a bay. Then I, at that time we had a rider. I follow where the people go. I always go where no one gone. I wanted to be always in peace. The rule was, well, it was a gentleman's agreement that the first boat that piled the fish out of the patch of fish that that school become his and the other boat should veer away or, or go and find another patch. There was a sort of a gentleman's agreement, you didn't come too close but you know they'd do a, a turn you know and sometimes they'd come in towards you and and there was the, the they'd be chumming on the other side of the boat so you couldn't see or or one particular bloke he, he used to flush them down the toilet the bait, so you know, you, it looked like they weren't doing anything, but they were flushing the bloody bait down the toilet to try and get get the you know get the, the tuna across to their boat. A couple of times we held up the 303, and we never used it. We never intended to use it, but uh, it used to give them the message that yeah, let's go get another patch. Yeah, we, I got all right with the Croatians. Yeah, they were a bit more aggressive than what I was, you know, had a patch of fish, they'd just come and take it away from me, well, I, I couldn't do that. Um, yeah, they'd come up alongside, you know, and just throw all the bait there and they'd just follow that boat and take it away from me. But I still ended up with the, with the amount of fish, yeah. 
but racing for the schools was a big thing. That was one of the things that you would, um, I can remember racing, you know, 30, 40 miles. The plain spotter said there's a patch of fish south of Rocky Island on the shelf. That's the only patch I can see. Dinko Lucan was there. Uh, there was only Dinko and, and us there. And we both headed off for this patch of fish. And we were about a mile apart when we started. And by the time we got to the shelf, we were actually side by side. And I was in the wheelhouse and I thought, I'm not going to give way to him. And we had got to the stage where Dinko's crew were shouting out at him, hey, 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 what are you doing? Dinko did not flinch. They even had poles out pushing, keeping us. We were just about touching each other. And by the time we got to that patch of fish, we both got there together. We both hit it together. They went down and we bloody got nothing out of it. Croatian immigrant Tony Franoff began building timber fishing boats in Sydney in 1964, turning out boats to a fairly even design and layout. These included such vessels as Jadran, Oreo and Lincoln. In 1969, following the action in South Australia, he established a yard in Port Adelaide, known as Carly Boat Building. In time, he turned to steel, and as K-ship construction produced the greater percentage of the tuna boats and prawn trawlers built in South Australia. The mighty roar of engines are heard from miles around As we all head out to the bites, to the tuna fishing grounds We wave our last fun goodbye Yeah, the next sort of generation of boats, the steel boats that came along, that's when the power was really applied. They um, they jumped up to the tent, they became ten knotters and the horsepower went up and, and but of course they could never get above their really above their ten or twelve knots with that type of boat. It's a displacement hull and that was it. They'd reached their their maximum. In the quest for speed, Stan Lucan commissioned the seventy foot Aislin designed to do fourteen knots. Dinko Lucan then acquired the smaller, faster Superdog designed to get the fish first and thus claim the school, which he could then pass on to his larger vessels to catch. Superdog was later to become involved in a heated dispute over rights to a school of fish. 